Um, can you give me a thumbs up, Liz, if you can hear me? Okay, awesome, thanks. So welcome to the 2022 Groundfish Seminar Series. We are recording this and an MP4 file will be posted to our webpage at the Alaska Fishery Science Center after the seminar. This is the sixth of nine weekly Groundfish seminars running through December 13th. And since we're doing this seminar remotely, the speaker will use an electronic corner or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slides. To help with this format and avoid additional distractions, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar or type them into the chat box and Liz and I will compile them for the end. And before I introduce today's speaker, I wanna remind everyone to join us for our next speaker, Richard McBride from the Northeast Fishery Science Center who will be talking about fishing for science, enhanced biological sampling with fishing partners for assessment and management of Atlantic halibut and wolffish, which will be held three weeks from now at the same time on Tuesday, November 29th. So you're getting a couple week break. Um, but today's speaker is Julia Calderwood. She's joining us from Ireland. So thank you for taking time out of your evening to speak today at 6 p.m. there. <laughs> Julia is a researcher working as part of the ecosystem-based fisheries management team based at the Marine Institute in Galway, Ireland. She originally joined the Marine Institute seven years ago to work as part of the Horizon 2020 funded Discard Less project examining the impacts of landing obligation on European fisheries. In 2020, she was awarded a starting investigator research grant from the Science Foundation Ireland to start the iFish project which aims to explore the development of information sharing networks in Irish fisheries to aid in reducing unwanted catches. So take it away, Julia, thank you for joining us. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so today I'm gonna to be talking a bit about the work I've been doing since I joined the Marine Institute, looking at the use of apps that can help assist fishers in reducing unwanted catches. Um, I just thought I'd start for anyone who hasn't been fortunate enough to come over to Ireland and visit us. So I'm based at the Marine Institute and this is our um, headquarters, which are based in, um, well, just outside um, Galway City in County Galway. And the Marine Institute is the state agency responsible for marine research, um, technology development and innovation in Ireland. And as I say, um, our main headquarters are based there in Galway Bay on the edge of the Atlantic. Um, but yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, apps and um, use in fisheries. And as kind of mentioned, this work originally started as part of the Discarders project. Um, Discarders ran for four years from 2015. It was a big European project with partners across Europe looking at developing strategies for the gradual elimination of discards in European fisheries. And this work came about, it was motivated by the introduction of the landing obligation in European fisheries. So prior to reforms of the common fisheries policy in 2013, um, discards were permitted in European fisheries. So commonly um, below minimum conservation reference size fish would be discarded um, during um, catches because these weren't marketable. And then once any quota was reached for any one species, then over quota species would also be discarded. Obviously, there's lots of concern about um, discarding and issues kind of around these. And so with this increase in concern, the, um, the, the common fisheries policy was kind of overhauled and the landing obligation was introduced. This was gradually introduced over a number of years, but it was fully implemented by 2019. And after this point, theoretically, um, the discarding of any quota managed species was prohibited. So species that aren't managed by quota can still be discarded. But for those that are quota managed, um, all species, all catches now have to be um, landed regardless of their size with the small undersized minimum conservation reference size fish um, going against quota. And theoretically, once any one quota is reached, fishing should stop, especially in mixed fisheries, because there's risk that the um, fishing vessels might exceed quotas, even whilst um, targeting species for which they have larger quotas. So again, I thought I'd just do a little bit of background on how the quota system works in um, European fisheries. So um, through sort of stock assessment and then negotiations at an EU level, the quotas are set each year. And these are then distributed out to each of the EU member states based on the concept of relative stability. So this um, is based, it goes back to sort of the 1970s and um, the kind of chunk that each country get is based on sort of historic fishing patterns. 
um, what they had previously fished for in different regions. So they each then get sort of different um, chunks of quotas for different species based on their historic fishing patterns. And then it's up to each of the EU member states to decide how they want to kind of dish out the quota to their fishing vessels. And this is done differently in um, each of the different countries. Ireland's quite unique in that it has a monthly quota system. So quotas are set um, on a month by month basis. And it's also quite unique in that um, each vessel within kind of um, particular fleet segments, they all get allocated exactly the same quota for kind of all quota managed species. So in the demersal um, fisheries, they um, all the vessels will have the same quota each month, regardless of like what they're kind of mainly targeting. And then any remaining quota at the end of the month kind of goes back into the pot and gets redistributed out. In Ireland also, there are no options for swapping or selling or leasing quotas. What you get is what you use. And that's it. Um, the fishing, the fisheries are kind of seen as a public resource. And so each fisherman who has a license has equal access to it as anyone else. So that's kind of like a unique system as well. So prior to the full introduction of the landing obligation, um, colleagues of mine wanted to get an idea of what kind of impact this might have, especially on our demersal um, fisheries. And so this was an example for some trials that took place. Um, with observers on board and they logged kind of everything that was caught um, and may have, may have also been previously discarded over the course of um, a month um, to look at the impacts uh, the landing obligation might have. So as I say, this was a trawler targeting mixed demersal fisheries operating in our Celtic Sea area and just focusing on three of the main demersal target um, species here. So this particular vessel in this month of July had um, half a ton of cod quota, two tons of haddock quota, um, and close to 60 tons of whiting quota. But um, if it had been fishing under landing obligation scenario, it would have reached its haddock choke after just 13 hauls. And theoretically, fishing would have had to kind of stop at this point. It then would have reached its cod choke after 23 hauls, but it wouldn't have reached its whiting choke until, or whiting quota until after 51 hauls. So if it had stopped after the 13th haul, because its had a, um, quota had been reached then, it would have missed out on lots of opportunity to fill its whiting quota. So especially in the mixed demersal fisheries where there can be some kind of seen as sort of quota mismatches, it can be quite hard to um, optimise catches to target the things you have lots of quota for whilst avoiding the things where you have um, limited quota, especially when the fish kind of co-occur together, they have similar morphologies and similar sizes. And so obviously um, selective gear types can help in some ways to increase selectivity, but it's maybe impossible to separate all fish apart from each other um, in these mixed fisheries. And so as part of the discarders projects, we wanted to look at, um, as well as using um, selective gears, how fishermen could maybe change their fishing behaviour and fish in different sort of spatial and temporal patterns to maybe optimise their catches a little bit better. So we wanted to look at these kind of tactical changes and how they could um, influence fishing behaviour and their catches. So as an input into this work, we used observer data. So that's um, guys working on the commercial fishing vessels and collecting information about the whole catch as well as the components that might be discarded in addition to those landed. As this is the only data source we have on this kind of whole catch information rather than just landings. Um, but in Ireland and much of Europe, uh, observer coverage is really, really low. Observers only go out on sort of few vessels at any one time. We have very low coverage. So although this data set is really important in terms of giving us a full picture of what's being caught at sea, it's quite sparse. Um, but we were lucky in the Discarders project because it was a big international project. We had partners in France and in the UK, and we were able to pool our observer data. This was actually the first time this had been done because it's deemed as kind of like quite sensitive information. But we managed to come up with an agreement um, to kind of anonymize it and do it at a particular spatial scale. So you couldn't pull out any like one um, individual vessels kind of data. But this helped to build our data set a bit bigger and gave us something more to work on to um, look at how we could use this data to kind of come up with some ideas to help um, kind of plot where certain species might be. And this could help inform fishing practices. So what we did was we just concentrated on those quota managed species as these were the only species that are subject to the landing obligation. 
We split the data into the above minimum conservation reference size and below minimum conservation reference size fish. That's because there's different reasons that a fisherman might want to avoid or target these. The fishers want to avoid the below minimum conservation reference size fish at all times, as these now count against quotas, but um, they can't be sold for human consumption, so there's no real economic gain in landing them. And then for the over um, minimum conservation reference size fish, they might want to target them at some points when they have the quota and then avoid them other times when they kind of the quota is getting limited. And then we looked at two different metrics. We looked at catch per unit effort. So we looked at how much of the fish was being caught in kind of over a tow or over an hour of fishing. But we also looked at the proportion of any one of these um, species or size classes in the catch because um, the fishers might be more interested in looking at where they might get sort of cleaner catches amongst the fisheries, especially when they're kind of running out on quotas for a number of species. So each of these different metrics, these different size classes and these different ways of measuring the catch, um, we basically found the average values in 0.2 by 0.2 degree rectangles. And what we did was we came up with a big stack of maps. So we looked at annual patterns and we also looked at quarterly patterns. But basically here, I think this was um, haddock, so it's showing the percentage of large haddock um, in the catch at any one time. So you get these kind of like heat maps with the yellow colour showing lower percentage of haddock in the catch and the red colour showing higher percentage of haddock in the catch. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to identify where there were consistencies in the catches over time. So we wanted to basically almost produce a kind of probability map of where you've got a high likelihood of catching something or there's like much more variation in the catch. So we took these maps and over the multiple years we identified where these grid cells were consistent and we took those points to produce um, interpolated maps. So as we say, we kind of view these as a bit of a probability map really. So the darker colours, the oranges and the reds are where you've got a higher chance of encountering um, um, haddock and the green are where you've got a lower chance of encountering haddock. This is based on consistent patterns over time. So we produced a really big stack of these maps for all these different species um, at different times a year. Um, and we wanted to make these available to the fishing industry so they could have a look at them and see if they might be useful um, to them. As I say, though, really big stack. So we put them all into an interactive app so they could access them. Uh, so hopefully this little video, yep, have a little video playing of how the app works. So here, for example, you can choose your vessel type, which is a kind of size category we have. You can choose the species that you're interested in looking at. And you can choose the size of that species, so it's above or below minimum conservation reference size. Say we had annual data, but also quarterly data. And then whether you wanted the CPUE or the proportion metric. And again, here you can kind of identify these hotspots of where there's a high probability of kind of catching quite a lot of this fish. But all these maps are kind of individual. It can be quite hard to extract information out of them. So in the app, there's also the possibility to kind of overlay the information you're interested in. So again, here you might want to put in a target species, for example, Weising, for which you have a lot of quota and you want areas where you're likely to catch a lot of that. And then you might want to overlap that with Haddock if you didn't have so much quota for that. So you can overlap it with the above and the below minimum conservation reference size Haddock. And then all these layers um, show up on the one map. So you can see how they interact um, and you can see where the green layers don't over interact with the red and orange layers, which is quite a small area. And it kind of this map on itself highlights the problems that you have in mixed fisheries with all these um, species co-occurring. But this app gets, gives fishermen the chance to go in and kind of look at the species they might be interested in, either targeting or avoiding and overlaying all that information together. And so we think this is a fairly useful tool. Um, and if anyone wants to go and have a little play around with our um, app, it's freely available online. Um, it's still, I suppose it's still in development really, but yeah, this is available for anyone to go and have a look at. So please do. So, but with this um, app, we, you know, all that information's there, but we wanted to determine if it might actually be useful, if it might help in fishers and um, better targeting certain things and avoiding others and meeting the requirements of the landing obligation. So we did some fairly simple um, modelling exercise to assess this. So we, again, we wanted to take this scenario where um, a vessel has a large whiting quota, but quite a limited haddock quota. So they'd want to target areas where there's um, a high likelihood of catching whiting, but avoid the areas where there's a low likelihood of, or where there's a high likelihood of catching both the large and the small haddock. 
So basically we ran through six different scenarios. So we had an unrestricted fishing scenario where a fishing vessel could fish anywhere in this Celtic Sea region. We then had a scenario looking at avoiding the below minimum conservation reference size haddock. So that's a fishing vessel fishing outside of the orange areas highlighted in the map. Then a scenario avoiding the above minimum conservation reference size haddock. So that's um, fishing outside the red area on the map. So um, which does take up most of the map. Then um, a scenario of avoiding all the haddock, so avoiding the red and the orange areas. Then a scenario where the fishing vessel just looks at targeting writing, so it fishes is within the green areas where there's a high likelihood of catching writing. And then a final scenario where it looks at targeting writing but avoiding haddock, so it just fishes in those small green areas that aren't overlapped by the red and the orange. So we fed into our model some um, data on catches again derived from some of our other landing um, from some of our other observer data and also into our model we fed in um, data on kind of price of catches and the activity of vessels in different areas and then what we basically did is we ran scenarios with our little virtual fishing vessel fishing until it hit the hazard quota and then we looked at how much whiting it had caught in that time and kind of how long it had been fishing for so these are the results from our modeling exercise. So these are those six different scenarios. And in this graph, you can see the whiting catch at the point that the haddock quota was reached. So the point that the fishery has theoretically choked on haddock. And really all you need to see is that the last two bars are much higher than the rest of them. So in our scenarios where our vessel is either just targeting whiting, uh, the high whiting areas, or it's targeting the high whiting areas that aren't overlapped by the high haddock areas, you get much greater whiting um, caught before the haddock quota is reached. And interestingly, actually, the highest amount of whiting was caught by just concentrating in those high whiting areas and not even worrying about the haddock. So by giving the fishing industry more information about where they're likely to encounter um, the things that they've got the most quota for, maybe they can maximise on those quotas a bit before they run out of quota for other species. So then we looked at the hours fished um, at the time before the hazard quota was reached. And again, you can see as we progressively try and avoid those um, kind of high hazard areas, the vessels are fishing for longer before they reach their hazard quota, which kind of makes sense. But again, if we look at those last two green bars, the time spent fishing is much lower than all the other scenarios, despite catching more whiting in that time. So again, by targeting these high whiting areas, the, the vessels are actually fishing kind of more economically. They're catching more of the whiting, um, but fishing for less time, so using up less fuel. So again, using these kind of maps could be beneficial. And then finally, we also looked at money earned in each area. So as I say, here we've got a really simplified version. We're just comparing two species, but in reality, these vessels are catching lots and lots of different species. It's a mixed demersal fishery. Um, and so they're making money from lots of different things. But we're in, in this scenario, um, by fishing in these high whiting areas, we're not kind of suggesting that the fishermen should go fish in areas where they're not making money. So there's no reason for them not to target their fishing in this way. They're making lots of money by fishing in these high whiting areas. So again, this kind of shows the potential of this, um, this mapping kind of app approach. But as I say, this is, this is fairly simplified. This is just, we just looked at one species versus another. In reality, it's a lot more complicated than that when there's multiple kind of quotas being used up at once and different species being targeted. But still, there's definitely potential in this approach and by making it available to the fishing industry. Um, and if you want to find out any more about the development of that tool, we had a paper published back in 2020 about, um, about that. As I say, um, we kind of built this as something that we thought might be useful in helping the industry improve kind of tactical decision making um, in meeting their quotas and meeting the requirements of the landing obligation. But we wanted to take it back to the industry themselves and see what they thought. So that's what we did. We showed the maps and the app to quite a few guys that we work with and we found out what they thought about it. And, and generally, they were positive in that they thought that the patterns that we had kind of found in the maps did generally represent the seasonal patterns that they see when they're fishing. Uh, nothing kind of unusual sprung out of them, which is good in terms that the maps aren't kind of not meeting with the fisher's knowledge. But also because of that, and because of the temporal and spatial resolution that the maps were at, because of the data that we had, we couldn't really do them um, at a finer sort of temporal resolution than quarterly. So they just showed these seasonal patterns. 
And the fishing industry said to us that because of that, it's not going to be a resource that they use that often. Maybe they'll refer to it every now and again, but it isn't really things that they don't already know. And because it's shown these sort of broad patterns, it's not necessarily helpful on a day to day basis when they're trying to decide where am I going to go fish today? They said that for it to be more useful, they would like it at a higher kind of temporal and spatial resolution. And also they'd like kind of more real time information fed into it so that they can respond to those maybe sort of unforeseen captures that can catch them out and can potentially lead them to go over quota for species they have limited quota on. But with the way that the observer program works in Ireland, um, there's no way we can really increase observer coverage to have the observer data to feed into this. So that's when we started to think about other information sources we could use. And really the fishermen themselves are, are ideal um, kind of source to provide information on what is being caught right now. And if they can share this um, amongst themselves, this could potentially be fed into something like these background maps and um, provide information on what's happening right now so that they can better avoid things in near real time. So that led on to the development of the iFish project where we're looking at developing information sharing networks in Irish fisheries to achieve this goal. Um, so real-time information sharing in fisheries isn't a, a sort of new concept. There's quite a few programs that run currently or have done in the past that look at this. For example, there's a sea state program where observer data is collated on a daily basis and returned to participating vessels in the form of rolling bycatch hotspot maps. Um, I know sea state have worked in a number of different fisheries in the States, but for example, this has helped in the avoidance of chum and Chinook salmon in the Pollock fisheries in Alaska. And um, on the right here, there's a map that kind of shows an example of the rolling hotspot kind of information that they provide um, to um, to the fishing industry to help them avoid these bycatch species. Uh, Batmap was a web-based app which has been developed um, for Scottish skippers. Again, the introduction of the landing obligation motivated this um, technology to be produced. This has been done in collaboration with uh, researchers at Aberdeen University along with the Scottish fishing industry. And um, at the minute, the fishing industry can log total catches of cod and whiting, both in this area, which were proving to be sort of choke species under the landing obligation, but also spur dog. Um, when the researchers were working with the industry, they indicated that spur dog was something that they wanted to be able to avoid. So that was added into the system. And basically, if catches are higher than an agreed threshold, an automatic alert is triggered to inform participating vessels, and then they can avoid these areas, although it's all voluntary whether they want to do it or not. And sometimes the technology in these systems isn't quite as complex. So Pro Delphinus is a radio conservation program in Peru. So basically, radio fleet communication scheme is used for small scale fisheries, and this was initially developed um, to try and avoid turtle bycatch. Um, so the fishers can report when they either catch a turtle or kind of encounter turtles. And then this information is broadcast on the radio. So fishing vessels in a really large area can hear about this and try to avoid these areas. But in exchange for reporting bycatch information, the program provides fishers with updates on winds and currents and tides and weather. So it provides them with um, uh, information in exchange that they couldn't otherwise access from their small scale vessels. So it's just another example of these real time information sharing schemes that are, do already exist. But as we were embarking on this piece of research and we wanted to work out kind of why industry might partake in these schemes, we did some research on this. This is especially we thought important to understand because a lot of um, fishing industry are quite secretive about what they catch. They don't always want to share this information. And we wanted to look at sort of past information sharing schemes and current information sharing schemes to see what it is that motivates fishers to take part. So we produced um, this article looking at that. We reviewed 15 examples from the literature um, and we kind of identified the main reasons that we saw for fishers engaging in these schemes. So certainly some of them were related to legislation and fisheries management, such as restrictive quotas of bycatch and choke species and things such as the landing obligation. Also things linked to rewards and benefits. There could be the benefit of extending a fishing season if you haven't reached a particular quota for longer. And so you can fish for other things for longer. 
Also direct incentives, such as um, additional quotas actually being offered to fishers for them to share information. Um, there's sort of issues around trust and sharing and uh, maybe sharing with your peers might be sort of more likely than sharing with people you don't know. Also, when you're given confirmation that data will be stored securely and it's maybe shared anonymously so no one can trace it back to anyone. Proven success of schemes or perceived success of schemes can um, increase sort of buy in. And also just when it comes to practicalities, um, fishermen are busy, they don't have lots of time to kind of input this data. So ways that make it easier to do that, you're more likely to get buy in and uptake. So this was all really important information for us to kind of like collect as we think about how we're going to develop our potential information sharing scheme. We have identified the potential for using a mobile phone app in our case. And so again, um, I've done some research looking at the use of mobile phone applications in wild capture fisheries. There's quite a lot of um, research looking at their use in recreational fisheries, but not so much in commercial fisheries, possibly because a lot of commercial vessels, especially in larger scale fisheries, um, have a fleet of instrumentation already on their boats that does lots of things um, in terms of sort of technology wise and providing information. But um, mobile phone app apps increasingly can replicate quite a lot of this um, technology. And this could be especially useful in maybe smaller scale fisheries where they either don't have the space on board for all of the tech or don't have the money to buy all of the tech. And so again, um, we just wanted to look at what smartphone apps can kind of provide in commercial fisheries. And we identified a number of different um, main kind of themes uh, that they fall under. So certainly um, in terms of science, knowledge and data gathering, there's quite a lot of apps out there now for electronic, electronic model, monitoring and providing logbook information, as well as uh, maybe providing catch sampling information to different um, organisations and government bodies, and even opportunities for citizen science. There's quite a lot of apps linked to employment, legislation and safety. So um, fishermen can log kind of things are linked to the employment legislation, such as working time directives and log the, the crew on board. But they can also receive information back about rules and regulations or quota availability. And there's actually a number of apps that look at um, letting fishermen take photos of illegal activity at sea and log this so it can be reported and possibly prosecutions can be made. There's also um, apps linked to value chains and post harvest, such as traceability, and also marketing and direct sales. This was actually something that increased during the beginning of the pandemic, where fishermen kind of lost traditional routes of maybe selling to restaurants. And so they could set up and sell directly to the consumers. And then there are apps that provide information back to the fishers, such as weather warnings and um, location of static fishing gear and potential fishing zones. And increasingly, it does seem that um, app technology in commercial fisheries is increasing. And so we think there's the potential for using apps in um, in our work, looking at information sharing as well. So, as I say, we um, were keen to build on the kind of, I suppose, the feedback we got from the industry with our static maps and looking at how best we can um, integrate more real time information into this. And this process is really kind of stakeholder driven. We're looking at working closely with industry to develop these ideas. So we produce a tool that is actually useful for them and not something we think is useful for them. But there are certainly some hurdles that we have to overcome. Um, there is a reluctance to share information in Irish fisheries. So we've um, done some, well, we've gone out and chatted to individuals, done some interviews and, um, we get told that trust absolutely nothing, don't believe anything. They tell me there's nothing in such and such area, but next day you'll find they've gone back there. This was one fisherman referring to other vessels that he can watch like um, their, their VMS kind of tracks and see that they're fishing in areas where they maybe told him the day before that it was rubbish fishing there. So obviously there wasn't. Um, a lot of fishermen are scared to share information because it could result in departments saying, oh, we're going to close all this area. There's concerns in the industry that if they kind of share information to say, oh, look, there is quite a lot of things we should be avoiding in this area. And it's something they choose to do voluntary. They could actually, you know, management um, authorities could actually take that and make permanent closures. And that's something the industry are concerned about if they start sharing this information. 
And um, I even had one fisherman tell me, I don't even tell my crew where we are fishing. Um, he likes to keep the top spots secret and was very, very careful about who he told where they were. So this just kind of shows some of the reluctance um, to share information with anyone. Um, so trying to build up these information sharing schemes could be tricky. But we thought we'd start small. We're looking at potential peer to peer sharing. So looking at small groups of fishers that maybe already work together to get them to kind of share information together first. And then we can build on that and hopefully slowly roll things up. Because we have had fishers tell us that most people have three or four boats they work closely with. I have three or four boats and I know whatever they tell me is the truth. And I like the competition of finding the good spots to fill my quotas first, but I'm happy to pass on that information once I've got my film. And sharing information on the things we need to avoid would be useful. So there is some buy-in into these ideas, despite the lack of trust um, and possible lack of willingness to share information in the fleet. But as I said, we wanted to start small and look at some of these groups of fishermen that already work closely together and look at developing these tools with them. And then maybe um, then we can start to build up from there if there's success. And so we have identified a couple of different um, producer organisations and organisations that are quite keen to work with us. And so we're working alongside them at the moment. And to say, we're working with them to extract more information to build a tool that's really useful. Um, so one of the producer organisations we're working with, uh, they actually work in the nephrops or the large kind of prawn fishing fleet, and they have um, a few concerns about potential things they'd like to avoid, and also to try and improve the sustainability of their fishery, so they can go for things like the Marine Stewardship Council certification. Um, so we've been working with them, and we, we've had a few chats with the industry and with their sort of producer organisation representatives. But despite the fact that we really want the industry to help us design these apps, they said to us, like, it's really hard if we start with a complete blank slate. We need to kind of go to them with options and start conversations from there. So that's what we've been doing. And we've actually developed a lot of kind of visual kind of cue cards, I suppose, to look at potential options of what an app could look like um, so we can start these conversations. And even if they don't like the options, at least it kicks off our discussions. So, for example, we've been told in this fishery in particular that undersized whiting is a bit of an issue and also the fishers want to avoid spur dog because they take a lot of time to sort through the catch and can damage the catch. But we wanted to say, for example, do you just want to note that you've come across whiting in an area or do you actually want to um, provide information about like the weight and actual quantities? And is it more important to know if there's an awful lot or is it important just to know that there's some? So that's kind of one example of a choice. Also in terms of recording like their fishing location, is this something they'd like to do automatically and it kind of comes off of either the GPS on the phone or it links up with some kind of instrumentation on the fishing vessel um, and that can just be stored automatically? Or is it the case that maybe they don't have time to record this directly when they're hauling so they'd like the option to kind of input the data themselves later? And also like how would they like the information fed back to them so do they just want like sort of exact locations of where some of these catches have been or more sort of interpolated options and as i said another real important thing is looking at the sharing of this so do the fishers only want to share information um, with those they've agreed to share with so for example, in like the PO we're working with, they can agree to share with all those guys and they'd be happy to do that. Would they be happy to build up from that and share with all registered app users? And if not, does that mean if we develop an app, there kind of has to be separate login for different sort of like friend groups? Um, or potentially over time, would they be happy to share with anyone who chooses the app? Because certainly there would be benefit with the more data that's being used, the more information they'll be getting back and potentially it's more beneficial. But these are kind of things that we're working out at the minute. And as I say, it's, it's quite a slow progress. Um, a lot of this research has been quite impacted on by COVID initially. We couldn't get out on the ground as much as we wanted to chat to guys and get their feedback. But we're doing that more now and we're looking at building on these ideas. And again, when it comes to the information, we're looking at the kind of security and who owns the data. So there's the potential that the fishers could share information on certain unwanted catches. 
this information could be fed in to produce these hotspots of where these things are. And then after a certain number of days when maybe this information isn't valid anymore, that data gets deleted. It's not stored anywhere. Or it could be stored and used by the fishing industry themselves so they can see kind of patterns and things over time. And we can look at more analysis and feed this more into those almost like those hotspot maps I showed earlier and they can see the temporal trends and things. But then there are issues in terms of whether the data is just accessed by the fishermen or if it's also accessed by ourselves um, and maybe they don't want to share it with us because they fear it might be used for other purposes. So these are other considerations that we're taking into account when we're starting to look at developing um, these technologies and these tools. Um, but yeah, I've kind of whizzed through that actually, but um, that's kind of what we've been doing to date and we're still developing these tools and still working with industry to try and work out um, yeah, what, what, what will be optimum for them. And then we're hoping that within the next year or two, we might have something ready for um, testing. And then if it's successful, we'll look at trying to build it up amongst other fishers and, um, and yeah, we'll go from there. And um, so, yeah, I just wanna say thank you very much for coming along today and listening. And um, we have more information on our website about the iFish projects. And as I say, you can access our Discardless app if you wanna have a play. And I'd just like to say thanks to all the different um, institutions that have been involved in this work and also our funders. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Julia, for that awesome talk. Um, so at this time, we'll go ahead and take questions from anybody. If you have them, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand virtually and unmute yourself. Um, but I'm sure Julia would be happy to take any of your questions. Looks like we have a hand raised by JP. You can go ahead. And Julia, yeah. Jay Peterson with NOAA Fisheries. Um, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I was wondering if, um, you know, I think fisherman perception, of course, as you pointed out on the apps, is when you share data, it always comes down to you're going to close my area. Um, it'll restrict the fishing. I just wondered if there's there. Is there any positives in the in the messaging or the possibility for the app where a emerging fishery could come out of it if they're able to report catch of new species coming into an area or uh, something along those lines where you could be identifying uh, potential opportunities for emerging fishery? Yeah, so that's one of the things we've been chatting to with the guys when we talked about kind of like why they might want an app and what the purpose is as I say. One of the fisheries we were chatting to, they were interested in logging things so they could show they're being more sustainable and avoiding certain species. Um, but yeah, we, we've kind of, we had discussions with them and it, they themselves said it'd be good to have information on what they are catching and sometimes what they're not catching. And if they have records of that, they can kind of keep that and show maybe they are becoming more sustainable or maybe the fish are moving, distributions are changing, there's different fish in the area. And so that was something that came up that they might be interested in. Um, I think one of the main kind of issues then is maybe then somebody has to be responsible for kind of curating that data and looking for those patterns and stuff. And whether that's someone who is in the PO or someone separate, that kind of maybe gets a bit tricky. But they themselves have seen the potential for recording different things and being able to see different species or changes over time and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. We have one question in the chat that says, has the app mostly focused on Irish fishers so far? Yeah, so in this instance, we're just looking at developing it within the Irish um, fisheries. So, um, and the Celtic sea fisheries, that's, that's been our primary focus, you know. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, Julia, it's Mike Paul. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, can you talk about what the potential, how big the potential user base would be? You may have got this. I showed up late, but and also, um, like, the, can, if this is successful, like the continuing funding for something like this. Yeah. So um, I suppose I don't know. I suppose the user base. I mean, 
it could be something that could be extended to the whole Irish um, fleet. As I say, we're starting small and we're looking at working with individual producer organisations and kind of maybe 10 or 15 vessels at a time and then building up from there. But there's potential for it to incorporate a lot more than that. Um, but yeah, the continued funding as well is something that is tricky. Obviously, this is a fixed term kind of funded project, but that's why we've been keen to engage with sort of a number of different organisations that are keen themselves to have this kind of technology and will be prepared to kind of take on maybe some of that burden themselves, either through them finding additional funding or. Um, yeah, I, yeah, but I suppose we're looking at something that hopefully if we can put in the groundwork to get an app up and running, we would like to have something that maybe doesn't have like incredibly high running costs. I suppose there's the data considerations and data storage costs, but um, something that could be fairly versatile and maybe easily adjusted for different fisheries um, without it being kind of really expensive. But that's a bit further down the line. But that is a consideration like that you need some kind of continuation to take this through and for it to be successful, maybe long term or in multiple fisheries. Any other questions? Give everybody another. Oh, okay. We have a question or a comment. Have you looked into this app? It looks like kingfisherbulletin.org. Um, it rings a bell. I'll have to have a. I'll have to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> and we got another um, comment from Sandy Sutherland. Massachusetts has done done something similar for recreational haddock, and there's a YouTube uh, link. Cool. Great. I will. I'll check that out as well. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you both for sharing those links. Um, give another five seconds for any anybody that still has a question that they'd like to ask. And then if not, we can go ahead and give everybody back some time and give Julia back her evening. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for taking the time to give this great talk. I think it sounds like everybody really enjoyed it. And we'll no see worries. you all. Yeah, thanks for me. <laughs> great. See you all on November 29th for our next speaker. Thank you.